I'd be I'm very pleased to um, welcome Natalie Bennett to speak to us first. Natalie's going to be talking about genetic modification. Great friend of Citizen Network generally, and of course a champion of all of this work. So, um, Natalie. Well, thank you very much, Simon, and thank you, Alicia, for initiating this and pushing forward with all of this. And I think that message of um, citizens making politics, one of my favourite phrases is making politics what you do not have done to them. And setting out the policies we need for the future is very definitely doing politics. Um, just to, well, first of all, a little apology. I'm afraid I'm joining you from the, uh, the Eurostar Lounge, so you may get the occasional announcement in the background. I've just got a meeting tomorrow when I, the logistics got complicated. Um, and you might want to know a bit about why I'm particularly talking about agriculture. So just to let you know, my accent uh, comes from Australia originally, those who don't know, and my first degree was actually in agricultural science. And why I'm particularly on the topic this evening, I've just been extensively engaged in the what was the bill, now the act titled uh, G, um, Genetic Technology Brackets Precision Breeding uh, Act, I would add uh, to that, oh no it isn't. But just to reflect on a couple of things that Alicia said first of all, I think we really have to acknowledge that there is actually plenty of food in the world, a huge amount of it uh, goes in food waste where perfectly good food is in factory farms fed to animals, I think that's something we'll be getting to later, and also of course there's a huge problem of distribution, and a problem with the quality of our food, traditionally we've thought only about calories, but we have huge problems with both under and over nutrition, uh, both people being overweight and people being underweight. Uh, and that's related very much to the quality of food available to people and the nutrients in those foods. So I thought what I'd do is split my time into roughly uh, three groups. Um, a little bit of an introduction about what's happening specifically in the UK and a little bit more broadly in Europe in terms of gene editing, uh, genetic technology, some of the risks, some of the concerns, some of the reasons why I would say that this is no answer to our food and farming future. Uh, and thirdly, um, sort of look at why it's the technology of the wrong kind of agriculture. So to start off with, um, I spent many days of my life uh, in uh, the House of Lords uh, debating this gene editing brackets precision breeding uh, bill now act. Um, the background to this is that many people may recall is there was an attempt to bring in what were known as GMOs, genetically modified organisms, uh, a couple of decades ago. There was a huge public backlash and there is significant GMOs around the world in America and South America in particular, um, but there's been a huge resistance to those within Europe, within the European Union uh, in many other places. Now, the definition, the way, the difference between generally described as between GMOs um, and what they propose will say gene editing is different, is GMOs, genetically modified organisms, uh, they have within them um, usually um, genes that come from different species, uh, if different, uh, often different families, different genera, um, uh, and so perhaps the, the worst case study of these Awful. is something called glowfish. Yes, that is a, um, a trademark term. What they did was they took awesome. colours, um, uh, genes that generated bright colours from jellyfish and sea corals, the, generate, the genes that generated protein for those, and implanted them into um, tropical fish usually held in, um, in fish tanks. Of course, some of these have escaped into the wild and are doing quite well and no one quite knows what the impact will be. Um, so that's what GMOs, the sort of thing there's been considerable resistance to. But what's happened um, in the technology since then, and I'm just going to mention this rather technical term because if you get into this issue at all, you'll hear it again and again and again, and that's CRISPR-Cas9, and that's a, an acronym C-R-I-S-P-R-C-A-S-9. And that's a particular tool, a way in which the proponents will tell you they can snip very precisely bits out of a gene and insert new bits into the gene. Um, so very simply they say, well, all we're doing is we're taking out some gene so it isn't expressed from a chromosome. This is a gene that codes from protein, so we're taking it out. So that's a really, really minor change and nothing to worry about. Now, I think it's interesting that um, anyone who's feeling um, possibly feeling really in need of uh, uh, some help with their insomnia, might like to sit down and read, or actually even if you are interested in, in it, the read the Cancer debates of the um, 
uh, of our debates in the House of Lords, because uh, it's a really a demonstration of this bill went first through the Commons, where there was no substantive debate at all. And in the House of Lords, we did have some pretty good quality, pretty hard debate, although I think it's really telling that essentially it was a three-way debate uh, between Lord Winston, who many people may know was the IVF pioneer, who was our genuine expert in the area of, 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 um, uh, of genes and chromosomes and how bodies interact with that. Uh, and Lord Krebs, who's uh, a crossbencher, a non-party peer, who's um, yeah. A uh, PhD is actually in bird populations, but he was very much there representing Rothop Stead, the gene technology sector, and me. And I'm afraid what we saw was the um, the three front, front benches, the government and uh, Labour and Lib Dem people, kind of standing up a lot and going, oh, this is all very complicated, isn't it, and sitting down again. And I'm not being terribly uh, simplistic when I say that. So it's a real demonstration of one of the problems we have when we're talking about policy in Parliament is we have very few people from a scientific background. And that's a real problem. So we had this debate. We managed to make one minor change. And there's a couple of NGOs who worked very, very hard um, to get even that one minor change. We have the government now um, has passed this law to say that we can have gene edited um, plants and animals. Um, and one of the debates we had some discussion around, Lord Winston brought, brought up, is you could, under this law, gene edit the great apes. You could gene edit um, companion animals, dogs and cats. And I was talking just to a vet recently. He was extremely concerned about that. Um, and what we will have now coming up probably fairly soon in a few months' time is the regulations to make that possible. Now, it's worth looking a little bit at the context of which this is happening, because um, it was actually the Europeans before the Britons who decided that gene editing was previously to be treated as GMOs and regulated in the same way, and food, anything that comes from it, having to be labelled, uh, which pretty well killed off the possibility of GMOs. Um, this law allows for no labelling. It could be in your milk, it could be in your meat, it could be in your bread, um, and there'd be no way for you to know that it was there. Now, Europe is debating this year, it is said Europe may change its position on that, although I think it's important to make a point on a couple of things, one of which is that um, uh, Europe is only considering plants, uh, not animals. Um, and there's, of course, if we have um, a legislative regulatory divergence from Europe, this is going to enormously complicate um, the export of any British products uh, to uh, the European Union. Um, so that's one of the issues in the background. Another issue is the fact that both Scotland and Wales have said they want no gene edited organisms uh, in their country, in their nations. Uh, of course, the problem with that is that um, uh, animals and plants uh, don't stop at borders. Genes certainly don't stop at borders. Um, and so there's a real uh, problem of uh, the divergence of regulation within our own, uh, within these islands as well, uh, existing there. So hopefully I, I have not dashed through too many acronyms and provided a bit of a sense of where we are now. What we're talking about is gene editing, which involves um, uh, genes from the same animal or simply or plant or simply cutting them out uh, as opposed to GMOs, which generally involved bringing in um, genes from different species. Now, I want to explain a little bit about the problems and the risks in here. Now, what all of this technology is essentially looking at is dealing with the genes that are on chromosomes, the kind of chromosomes that um, plants and animals have. Now, generally speaking, about 90% of a chromosome consists of what, when I did agricultural science 30 years ago, I was taught as was junk DNA. Anything that didn't, anything on the gene, that, on the chromosome that didn't code for a protein, that was just junk and um, an accident. We've now come to realise, and we're still very much um, coming to understand much better, is that um, uh, that so-called junk DNA actually has roles, immensely complicated roles that we really don't understand, um, that determines how genes are expressed, what genes are expressed, what level they're expressed at. So they actually very much control the development, growth, the shape of the organism, even if they're not actually coding for proteins. The other thing to say is that we now understand far much more what's known as plasticity, which is plants and animals um, develop in very different ways according to their environment, according to their circumstances, even according to pure chance. There was some fascinating work in nature recently about how um, 
uh, identical twins, their brains are different. And the only thing they could eventually come this down to is there are simply chances in development that develop just goes being one way or being the other way. So the fact is that um, the genome, the what used to be described as the genetic code of a plant or an animal. Great. Okay, I, I'm very sorry about that, everyone. I don't know. We just had one of those <laughs> internet glitches. Um, so I think I was talking Thanks, about man. how when, when you slice up slice up um, genes, um, they can join together in unexpected ways, in unpredictable ways. And these are known by the jargon as the jargon of off-target effects. Uh, and one of the things that we found recently is lots of people who've been researching this often for commercial uh, or with commercial in mind purposes. They've only looked to find out if they've got the effects they wanted and they haven't found out whether they've got the effects they haven't. So there's lots of off-target effects there. So I think that's perhaps I've done a, a little bit on, I'm aware of the time, uh, a little bit on... Um, um, some of the issues, some of the problems, some of the unintended effects. One of the other things to say, actually, I probably I didn't get entirely to, is the sort of phrase that that covers a lot of this uncertainty in terms. Of, I was talking about how um, how genes are expressed often varies enormously according to the circumstances or even chance. Um, the phrase that that sort of fits this in is phenotype does not equal genotype. So phenotype is what an organism actually turns like out like in the real world. The gene, gene genotype, the genes, is what was traditionally described as like a machine blueprint, but it's nothing like that clear cut. And a lot of the thinking behind the problems that I think is behind lots of our cause lots of our problems in our industri in our farming systems now is that idea that we can treat uh, plants and animals as though they were machines and they're not. So a couple of final points to make in my third set, which is why this is the wrong kind of technology is sort of associated with the wrong kind of agriculture. Um, this is the kind of technology that's associated with giant scale industrial monoculture. Um, you may well have discussed in, in the previous event that more than 50% of human calories come from just three crops. Um, that's a huge risk in terms of food security. It's incredibly bad for our health. Um, what we know for health and for food security, what we need is crop diversity, a huge number of different crops, ideally several different crops growing in the one field, which will also give us the diversity that's really good for um, plants and animals to thrive in. Um, but uh, gene editing is a technology of a few, a handful of those big industrial crops. And they are generally produced for big multinational food manufacturers. A classic example is rapeseed, which didn't appear in the UK until the 1970s. And it was essentially because companies like McDonald's uh, wanted their food to taste all the same all around the world. Rapeseed is very hard to grow in the UK, involves vast amounts of chemicals. Um, uh, and if you look at a field, you'll see them round about now, you know, a lovely field of green flowers. Of, of, of yellow flowers and green underneath. And you think, oh, isn't nature wonderful? But that's actually a biological desert. The amount of chemicals used to enable that to grow, and particularly fungicides, um, is a huge issue. So it's the wrong technology for the wrong kind of agriculture. One of the other things is coming back to the point about um, plants and animals not being machines. Um, uh, often you will hear people saying, and you'll see, I'm afraid the observer is a particularly, um, ha has one journalist who's particularly keen on this. We've found a gene technology that will save us from drought. Um, well, what that ignores is the fact that maybe you can uh, breed a wheat plant um, that may most of the time under a certain set of circumstances be able to suck more water out of the soil. But the question is, what's that going to do if you suck more water out of the soil? Because what we've increasingly come to understand is that um, many people might have heard that as humans, we have a microbiome. You have a gut microbiome that has impacts on your mental and physical health. You have a nose microbiome um, that recently there was some fascinating research in nature that linking that to um, incidents of um, hay fever. Um, plants also have their own microbiome. Indeed, plants essentially farm in the soil a collection of fungi and bacteria um, that help them get nutrients out of the soil. And so when plants actually produce um, photosynthesize to turn sunlight into sugars, essentially, about 30% of the energy that they actually do in doing that, they pump down into the soil to feed the fungi and bacteria around them that are actually as a complex form what's known as in the jargon as a hollow biant. 
uh, just as we are, we consist of about 50,000 different species. You are a holobiont. A wheat plant is also a holobiont. And this idea that you can treat it like a machine, just switch one gene on or off, and it's going to suddenly be able to deal with much more drought and suck more water out of the soil. But what's that going to do to the complex, the life, the other life in the soil? So I think I've probably, with, with an interruption, thrown a great deal of information um, and technical detail at people. I hope it was reasonably comprehensible. I hope people will sort of have a sense of what's happening on the big scale, gene editing um, being claimed to be different from GNOs, but having significant risks and being the technology of the kind of industrial agriculture that I think is very broadly agreed now we need to get away from. Thanks very much.